Okay, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here. And this is BXGS Weekly, JavaScript news podcast, bringing you all the best news of the week um, with whatever you could have missed or, you know, reading all the bad articles for you. Hey, Samohovitz, welcome to the stream. So it is episode 38, as I said. We have some stuff today. I mean, there is some pretty major news related to react for example but overall it's not an extremely eventful week i'm guessing because it's uh, you know black friday and all that kind of stuff in us so a lot of people are just taking vacations and resting and not doing much but uh, let's get started and see what we got this week around shall we okay first article we got here is called websockets a conceptual deep dive and this is exactly what you would expect from an article with this title it's a pretty in-depth a deep dive into the web sockets, both uh, into the concept level of it, as in, you know, why do we actually come up with it? Why do we need web sockets? Why can't we just use XHR? And how do you actually use them, um, including, you know, some code samples and the basic protocol format and stuff like this. So if you're curious about the web sockets, but we're still confused about how exactly they work or why you would need that, why not just use a simple fetch or XHR? This article will guide you through about everything you need to know about WebSockets, including the libraries you could use right now, including the VS, uh, Mu WebSocket, and a bunch of others. So if you wanted to get into WebSockets, this is a really, really good article to get started. Do check it out. Okay, next article we got here is Lint testing or why unit tests are worse than you think. Uh, yet another perspective article, let's put it this way, uh, that looks into test-driven development and how to write good tests yeah i'm putting the air quote marks here because well there's no precise answer to that question everyone has their own opinion on that so in this case the author's opinion is that you should write lean tests as he calls that or essentially is more or less the um, correlates with at least what i think and the articles that i covered before like write test not too many mostly integration by the can see dots for example because, you know, writing tests is not cheap resource wise and um, you should focus on important problems and majority of important problems are either end to end or at integration levels. Hey, Bakao, welcome to the stream. So this is exactly what the author suggests. He uh, cites a bunch of related work that basically reinforces his point of view, which is, you know, not surprising. But uh, yeah, if you wanted to... Um, have a different or let me how do I formulate that so if you wanted to read on another opinion about testing software not necessarily JavaScript software just software in general then this article does give you a pretty good uh, perspective on it uh, no back out you didn't miss uh, that much this is the second article um, so we are still just getting started okay so yes if you want to know more about lean testing because everything has got to be lean and agile nowadays I don't really like that name, but the article is solid, so give it a read. Okay, next article we got here is uh, what is happening with my Chrome, there we go. It's called Magic Grid. It's a simple lightweight JavaScript library for dynamic grid layouts. We actually looked at this library um, last podcast, so it was already covered in the libraries and demos section. This article is actually walkthrough of how the author built it and essentially a uh, step-by-step description of how the code works and what exactly happens in there even though the code itself is quite well documented anyway if you wanted to know how the magic grid was made and uh, i think this gift just makes my chrome die for some reason but uh, there you go so if you wanted to see how to make a grid like this in a step-by-step -step fashion essentially then do check this article out it will guide you through everything you need to know about that all right, continuing, we got hiding properties in JavaScript. Sometimes you want to define a property on an object that can be easily accessed by code you didn't write. So it's all about uh, hiding the properties and uh, figuring out how to do that specifically on the object. So it's not like talking about module or anything like this. Hey, Mikkel, welcome to the stream. Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a bunch of ways that work in, you know, for all browsers, like the old, you, your old good object defined property, we just define it as non-enumerable, then unless you know it is there, it's not going to appear in, you know, keys and foreign and so on and so forth. And go into using the non-enumerable symbols that are um, essentially really hard. I, I think it is actually impossible to get it from there unless you know the symbol specifically. So 
Um, and yes, to Vic Maps especially, yeah, so this is a newer feature that is only gonna work in the latest browsers, but uh, this is also a very neat uh, way of doing that essentially. So do check it out if you ever needed to hide some properties in your JavaScript objects. Um, it's not, you know, extensive article, but it does give you a pretty good overview of what is possible. Okay, next article we got here is adding pipelines to JavaScript. This is another one of those articles over um, overviewing the pipeline operator coming soon to the JavaScript. Uh, we already talked about it in this podcast more than once, but for those of you who haven't seen it or who haven't somehow um, discovered the pipeline operator yet, because I think there's been like a ton of articles about it, it is a really neat thing that allows you to chain uh, functions, right? So this is how it's uh, this is how syntax looks. Essentially, you put the first value and then you pipe it into a function, and then you can pipe the result into another function, and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of limitations and a bunch of problems related to that. Uh, yes, it is pure function composition. A lot of functional programming languages, are like uh, yeah, there's the Elm reason, Elixir, whatever, they already have that and like F sharp, whatever. There's like, this is a really cool thing and I really love that syntax because it can make the, if you write very functional code, it can make your life a lot simpler. There's a bunch of problems related to that and this is why proposal is moving uh, slower than it actually could have. Like for example, there is some ambiguities, like if you pipe it into a wait, what is gonna happen? Is it gonna await the value or is it gonna do something else? And it's like, you know, if you, if you have the, uh, so by default pipeline invokes the function uh, with the value as the first argument, right? What if your function takes in more than one argument? Uh, yes, I mean, you can use transducers here. Essentially it's just function calls. Um, but yeah, so there's essentially this is a very, very good overview of pipeline operator, including all the sort of edge cases that are still being discussed in a, TC39 working group, there is a link to the repo here. So if you're interested in the current st proposal status, which is actually interesting, I haven't looked at it for quite some time, which stage is it at? I, I personally, I would love to see that, um, I don't know, <laughs> you know, the sooner it's basically gonna get shipped, the better it's gonna be. Oh, there's already a Babel plugin for it. I should start using that because this looks really, really cool. Um, what stage is it? Wait a second, stage, is there stage one? Oh, is it actually moved it to stage one? This is really cool. I did not know that this actually happened. Awesome, okay. Well, there you go. So if you were curious about the pipeline operator or if you never heard about it, but now wanna learn about it, then do check this article out. It basically summarizes nicely pretty much everything you gotta know about that. All right, moving on. The next article we got here is build a view app with Firebase authentication and database. Um, Essentially a very basic tutorial on how to build a view application, a very basic one that relies on a Firebase backend. Uh, so if you ever wanted to do something like this, uh, this guide covers just about everything, you know, from setting up the project, configuring ESLint, adding end-to-end uh, -end tests and stuff like this, if you care about them. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not extremely complex, but if you never worked with Firebase, it's gonna be a pretty nice introduction Although I would say Firebase has a really good documentation. So, you know, it's not extremely hard uh, backend to get started with basically, but it does guide you through all the steps that you have to know, including, you know, there's like a screenshots of how to properly configure a Firebase application, what permissions you need to set, what kind of features you need to enable and stuff like this. So if you never used it, but uh, always was curious to check it out, this will um, kickstart your development, I guess. Okay. Next article we got here is a really cool one. This is the feature I did not know existed basically. The article is called Lighthouse Custom Audits Tutorial. And it talks about the Lighthouse Custom Audits as you might guess. So uh, you remember that Lighthouse tool, right? So if you open the Chrome DevTools, there's this um, audits panel and you can run the Lighthouse Audits, right? So it turns out there is a way to create the custom audits and uh, you can essentially measure custom, create custom reports from that, right? Which is kind of awesome when you think about it. And this tutorial, I mean, it's not very lengthy, but it is essentially guides you through um, the whole process of how do you exactly pick, you know, what, do you, what are you gonna audit in your page? How do you configure the custom audit? And how do you then run it and uh, output the result of it? So. If you wanna do more fine grain, I guess, auditing of your apps and are interested in uh, Lighthouse in general, 
then do check this guide out. It will give you everything you need to know to get started with uh, custom audits. I mean, again, it's not extremely large and the procedure is not extremely long as well, but um, this is a feature I didn't even know existed, to be honest. So it's really, really cool. And uh, if you're interested in making your websites and components faster, then do check it out. All right. Next article we got here is called Understanding Memoization in JavaScript to Improve Performance. And it's exactly what you would expect. It talks about the memoization, what it is, as in, you know, the general technique, as in if the, when you run the deterministic function, if the result is already cached, then just return the cache. This else is, by the way, redundant here. And otherwise, if it's not cached, then actually do something and then return the result once it's done, which means that all the consequent calls to the same uh, with the same parameters would result in immediate returns from the cache, right? Unless the cache expires, but this is like more complex cases. So it talks about doing that and then uh, implementing the very basic uh, memoization uh, with, uh, for example, square root function here. And uh, is it square root or is it? Uh, yes, it's square root. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, then, you know, going into more complex implementations that you can uh, use the memoize function for example the react now includes the memoize function for the oh boy the what am i the hooks api of course this is what i'm saying uh, so you got the memo memoize that will help you uh save time on uh re-executing functions right and the whole like thing with uh i am terrible today apologies so <clears throat> yes the react memoize function is aimed to be called on the uh, handlers of, you know, clicks or whatever event handlers that should not change unless you change something in the, you know, DOM or whatever. So, um, so yeah, this is a pretty good introduction to the memoization, including the basic uh, mathematical examples like, you know, Fibonacci and all that kind of stuff and factorials, which do display basically how memoization can save you time, but doesn't really give you any real life examples. But Hopefully the technique is simple enough to uh, for you to figure out essentially a way you can use it in your uh, code immediately. Okay, next thing we got here is real world testing recipes, node service that calls an external API. Um, this is essentially a tutorial on using, or I guess on testing your uh, apps that call third party services and then mocking those third party services using one of my favorite libraries called Knock. So if you're already familiar with Knock, you won't really find anything new here. But if you never heard about it, and if you have some code that relies on third party HTTP APIs, but you know, you're having problems with them being non responsive, or you don't want to hammer them because there's like rate limits, Knock can save you a lot of time, you can essentially fake any requests in the Node.js and respond with just about everything. The usage of Knock is super simple, you literally just say, uh, knock and then pass the um, URL, then you either specify the get post or, you know, other method, you can specify the query matching, and then you can specify the reply with um, code or body or stream or whatever the hell you want It's basically very flexible. So if you have a use case like this, this is a really good tutorial to knock. If you already know about knock, then again, you don't want to really find anything new here. Uh, but yes, Knock is awesome and you should uh, learn about it if you're writing any node apps that depend on third party API because testing with it becomes a breeze. All right, next article we got here is how to use Node.js without external frameworks and libraries. And is essentially, uh, it should be slightly renamed. Uh, it's more of a how to write your own HTTP server using Node uh, core HTTP and URL modules. And um, while this is a really good learning article, right? So it will introduce you to how the the whole like URL package works, how the HTTP package works. Uh, and it's really good to know and understand that I would not recommend doing that in production unless you absolutely must have, you know, the smallest, the fastest, the simplest server. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense because while you will save on speed and size, a, bit, a tiny bit, you know, depending on what you do. It will give you a lot of headaches related to managing the app and the whole like server later on. So um, I, I, it's just, you know, I had people coming to me and asking me like, hey, should I like write my own server framework or use Express? And uh, my, my answer is like a 99% just use Express. Yes, it's really good. There's, there's almost no reason to write your own thing unless you have some like, you know, amazingly specific case 
that Express just doesn't fit or, you know, doesn't produce enough speed. But then again, there's like better or faster, smaller frameworks like Micro or Polka, for example. But yeah, anyway, uh, as a just pure introduction tutorial on how the Node HTTP and URL packages work, this is quite good. So do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is using WebAssembly with React. Uh, it's a tutorial on how to use WebAssembly module with a React.js project. Um, and specifically how to generate fractals using, uh, well, it's actually, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, how to put it? So the article first goes, okay, let's build the fractal drawer using pure JavaScript, right? So we build this basic fractals and we draw it in the browser and it'll look super pretty. And then we're gonna re-implement the whole thing in WebAssembly and do the same thing and, you know, load the WebAssembly module into React and we're gonna render the same fractals using the WebAssembly. And there is no speed comparison. Like, when, I, I, I get it. I understand that the WebAssembly is going to be like probably a magnitude faster, right? Uh, because it is way more efficient, especially for tasks like this. But I want hard numbers. Like, come on, this is, this is just the article is just asking for the section on, hey, look how faster it is. Um, there is a source code, so if you're interested, you can actually check it out yourself. And I probably should try and do that and see how how much faster would it be. I'm actually curious as to you know how many frames per second you can achieve with both if you just re-render it constantly. I'm guessing it's going to be like a couple of frames per second for JavaScript and uh, 20, 30 for WebAssembly, maybe, uh, depending on the fractal complexity, of course. But uh, yeah, anyway, it's an interesting case study. Just a bit unfortunate. There's no performance comparison, but. Hey, so if you ever wanted to draw fractals using WebAssembly or wanted to learn how to use WebAssembly with React, disregarding the module itself, um, this is a really good article on that. Okay, next thing we got here is really, really cool one. Uh, experimenting with brain-computer interfaces in JavaScript. Um, it's a very deep dive. It's a very large article talking about using neural interfaces uh, with JavaScript and the sort of journey of, of the author from you know, starting working with the hardware, uh, starting from the Leap Motion, which is, by the way, a pretty cool device, and uh, go into the uh, brain sensors and neural interfaces that are uh, actually surprisingly fun to work with. So if you never tried those things, you can probably get them quite cheap right now. I mean, there's an, even a couple of years ago, they wasn't that expensive. They could be fun to play around with. Like, don't expect anything amazing with them, but you could do some very silly and fun things uh, related to that. So you got like, depending on the complexity and price of the interface, you will get a bunch of sensors. And depending on the number of sensors, you will get a bunch of brainwave data, like typically it's just, you know, like gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And you can correlate those brainwaves to specific activities. And then you can add um, machine learning to, you know, train something. And yeah, that's like, in the article covers stuff like, you know, merging it with WebVR to uh, create a 3D navigation space or merging it with IoT to allow controlling smaller gadgets and stuff like this. It is really cool. So if the area does sound interesting to you, I would highly recommend uh, checking out the article. There is a lot of very interesting information, including links to frameworks, discussions, and things like this. So um, very high quality article. Um, if the area is even remotely interesting for you, do check it out. This is like really, really cool. Um, if you have a chance, do try it out. It is very silly fun, especially what you can do with uh, brain interfaces and, you know, sort of small mini games. Um, it, it, like you can get started in no time with JavaScript frameworks uh, for that stuff. So yeah, okay. Uh, next article we got here is Demo Board, a live editor with every package on NPM. So this is, yeah, essentially this is another of, sort of live editors, right? But uh, with a catch. So first of all, it allows you to write JSX, oh, sorry, MDX is what I wanted to say. So markdown with JSX embedded. So you can actually create a markdown files that have uh, components in them and render things in them. And uh, second of all, it actually supports importing or requiring packages from NPM with, um, there's like description of how it actually was made using the Babel plugin that resolves the require or import statements and all of that is resolved to unpackage modules and uh, the modules are actually then loaded directly into the browser. So obviously that's not gonna work with uh, 
oh, what do you call them? The node modules, right? But if you are using any front end modules like React cards or whatever, that works perfectly fine. So you can even do things like this tiny game over here. And I keep screwing this up. This is actually the first level is quite easy. But then, you know, once you start going forward, God, I'm, why am I so bad at this? And all of that was made in this sort of editor. So it's it's kind of pretty cool, actually. So if you wanted a more front end focused editor that, you know, doesn't have any uh, significant back end, let's put it this way, I guess it still does the resolution of the modules on I'm not even sure if it does it on back end. Um, Yes, JavaScript. I mean, I wouldn't call it sci-fi things. The brain interfaces have been around for quite some time and they are really cheap right now. So you can, you know, you can easily buy one of those things and experiment at home, but uh, it does look very sci-fi. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, but uh, demo board looks actually like a really cool editor and I'm kind of curious to see how that will develop. So I think, I think still, blah, I still think that Code Sandbox is my favorite one, but uh, this this thing looks really, really cool. Okay, continuing, we got, if I were to invent a programming language for the 21st century. Now, um, this is not a very simple article, as in, you know, it's not complex in terms of what it talks about. The ideas and thoughts here are really straightforward, but it, it there's a significant plot twist at the end. So I'm not gonna spoil anything. I would just say that if you are interested in new God damn it. If you are interested in new programming languages, if you're watching, you know, for Swift, Kotlin, Golang, and all the others, and was thinking, oh, you know, they're kind of good, but not quite. Why don't we have like 21st century language that does this and this and this? Uh, for example, like, you know, the syntax that would just allow you to write sentences in English, which looks extremely weird to me as a developer, but hey. And then, you know, some types and, and stuff like this. Um, just, just, you know, just take five minutes and read this article. I'm not going to spoil how it ends, but um, I kind of, it talks about the thing that I never used in my life because it's very old. But turns out that um, this thing that it talks about is actually incredibly interesting. So let me just put it this way. So if you're, you know, if you have an even bare interest in other programming languages than JavaScript and in general sort of uh, programming languages um, development, let's put it this way, uh, just, yeah, just um, in the end, there's the pick of the languages that you can, you know, take from and just click one of those. It doesn't matter which one you click. There's more text coming after that. It took me a while to figure it out, actually. But um, yeah, it is definitely worth reading. It's just five minute read and it's amazing. Okay. Um, if you are talking about link at the end, uh, you mean, and to the whole articles, as is usual, you can find them in the uh, BXGS GitHub repository. Uh, it should be the link in the channel description or, you know, Twitch description or whatever you're looking at, so video description. Uh, it is all there. And this one is the last one in the article section, I believe. Okay, now we're coming to the shorter, smaller, tinier awesomeness uh, that we have here for today. First one is the tree data structure in JavaScript. This is a very basic uh, tutorial that guides you through how to implement binary search trees in JavaScript, right? Very simple, nothing too complicated here. Maybe you need this for some reason, like maybe you're preparing for the interview. Um, I would probably not be able to implement anything like this without actually looking in the wiki or somewhere because hell if I remember how binary trees work. Like I remember approximately how they work, but if I, if, we, if you would just put me in front of a computer and say, hey, implement me binary trees, I will fail immediately. But nonetheless, it's a really good um, introduction to it. So, you know, if you want a refresher or you're preparing for the interview, as I said, that requires that. Do check it out. It's a very good uh, basic implementation and there's like the tree walker and everything. So it's um, yeah, basically everything you've got to know. Next thing we got here is, oh yeah, this one is um, amusing news. Let's put it this way. On one hand, this is really awesome. So Google is going to pay JavaScript frameworks uh, to implement performance first code. So they, uh, they are going to create 200,000 US dollars funds to sponsor addition of on by default performance related updates in JavaScript frameworks and any people uh, authoring the frameworks can apply for this, which is really awesome, right? So this is really, really cool. So they basically are gonna give money to open source frameworks to make web faster, which is 
great. Like there's no downsides to that. On the other hand, we talked last time about the performance of Gmail, for example, and I wish they would, uh, you know, allocate the internal Google funds to make their own things faster. So there's just like a caveat here. <laughs> But uh, nonetheless, this is really awesome. And it was announced on the uh, Chrome Dev Summit. Google paying Facebook. Yeah, that would be interesting, actually. I would be curious to see if they will uh, they will actually fund the React. Although, you know, I don't think the React guys do really need those money because Facebook is probably paying them quite well. But uh, that would be quite hilarious if that ends up going like this. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, this is, this is kind of great. Okay, um, next thing we got here is... This uh, tiny tip from uh, Mr. Develop It, who is the author of Preact and a bunch of other really cool tools. You probably don't want .inner text in HTML. Turns out that it triggers layouting. I did not know that this is a thing actually. So if you use text content instead, you want to trigger layouting. So if you're accessing uh, content, text content in your HTML nodes, you know, directly, then do use text content instead of inner text. And if you're interested in more details, there's quite a lot of discussions here down below the Twitter thread. So do check it out. There's some very interesting things that I didn't even think about, to be honest. But uh, since he developed Preact and he's kind of optimized it for, you know, the speed and size, he knows a lot of very intricate details on uh, interacting with DOM. So it's really interesting to read about all of those tiny insights. Next thing we got here is an advice from Dan Abramov uh, that says how to know if a test sucks. You've changed something that wouldn't be observable to the user of your app or library, but the test broke and you had to fix the test, which is again, you know, that means your test is testing the specific implementation, not the actual API or integration of your app or library. So then again, coming back to the same point that we discussed, I think hundreds of times already on this podcast, Write integration tests. Unit tests are not as useful, unfortunately, majority of the time. So yeah, there you go. Okay, um, next thing we got here is the new um, free plan for all the open source and free customers of site now. They now uh, by default hide the source code, which is kind of incredible when you think about it. I did not think they would do something like this. And they also increase the quotas um, significantly. So we now have the 100 megabytes uh, file size per file. You had the 100 gigabyte per month instead of one of bandwidth and 100 gigabytes of storage instead of one, which is insane for free. So you can just, you know, get the site now and start using it and you get all of this for free, which is crazy. So it's like, it's a really good offer. And considering you can actually use the Docker images for like CI essentially there. And uh, they, I think they have the Google Actions coming up soon. This is going to be quite a ubiquitous platform. Um, so um, yeah, this, this is pretty exciting. Okay, um, yes, uh, to close the minor things section, we got two uh, cool things related to React. First of all, there's the new RFC thing uh, called context.write and it basically, um, it's a new API that allows you to write directly into context. So instead of, you know, changing some context provider prop, which is inconvenient uh, sometimes, right? You can actually use context.write as in where context is your created context to write a new value, right? So you can actually change it directly from any spot in the app, which uh, sounds very handy. So I never had a use case where I would need that, but that does indeed sound like a very handy thing. So again, it's still RFC. So there's gonna be probably some discussion and it's gonna be probably shipped in one or two versions later, but uh, really cool to see that. And my favorite one, um, React Hooks RFC, the one that everyone has been talking about for past three weeks nonstop is finally merged. So we got the, um, holy shit, there is thousand, almost 200 comments, 1200 comments nearly uh, on this RFC and it is merged now and it is likely that we're gonna see React 16.7 with hooks released to stable in the nearest weeks, I guess, right? So that means that the RFC is merged, which means the sort of the concept is more or less stable. And uh, from the comment of, um, uh, what was, God, I'm forgetting his last name, Sebastian, I think the first name, right? Uh, Mark Beach, yeah. So uh, the comment from Sebastian Mark Beach says essentially they're going with the initial implementation, which seems to work pretty well, which I totally agree with. And yeah, it's really exciting to see how, uh, how this all is gonna develop. So hooks are amazing addition to React in my opinion, but uh, yeah, there we go. 
Okay, releases section. We actually only have one release this week. It is Webpack version 4.26, and the only change is that they migrated from Uglify ES to Terzer. So Uglify ES is a package that is no longer maintained and caused some issues in, for example, latest version of React. And Terzer is the minimizer that is maintained actively and basically uh, supposed to be actually best, better and faster than Uglify ES. Uh, but there might be some minor bugs related to that. So if you are upgrading, keep an eye on that. And if you see something break, report the errors here and to Terzer repository. So um, yeah, that's that's basically it. Okay, that is it for releases is what I want to say. Now we're coming to the demos, libraries, and uh, all this kind of stuff section. And the first thing we got here today is the results of a state of JS 2018 survey, which was weird one. So they had some very weird questions in it this time around. I guess it still shows you some stuff, but um, the way they formed questions just irked me a bit the wrong way in the majority of cases. Also, can I just say that I hate the diagrams like this? Like I literally, that doesn't tell you like much. Maybe I just don't know how to read that, but in my opinion, it always confused me the, the, the hell out of me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the interesting thing is that there is, so they had this uh, separation of, you know, I used the technology, would use it again used it, would not use it again, heard it, would like to learn, heard it, would no, not interested or never heard of it, right? So there's like five stages and no in-betweens, which is like, um, in some cases, I guess it's it's justified, you know, when talking about the flavors, for example, I prefer ES6 and I would stick to it and I would just write a modern JavaScript, like TypeScript is okay. And here again, you know, even here, I already say, yes, I use the TypeScript, I think it's good, but I would only use it if, there would be some specific project requirements, you know? So I would not just take it and use it right away, which is like, Neh. And uh, yeah, they have the interesting, this is the interesting bit. So they have those matrices that um, outline the salary breakdown by the technology, which is kind of curious to see, to be honest. So there's like the closure script guy seems to be paid the most, which is just kind of crazy, but um, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of data, so I won't go through all of that. There's like, you know, the front end frameworks, data layer, back end frameworks, testing, mobile, other tools, opinions, awards. So you can actually have a look at what the user awards and highest interest and all that kind of stuff was. Just go and look at it. Uh, take it with a grain of salt, is what I'm going to say. Um, because again, those, you know, the gradation of the answers is a bit weird. And I would like, there's sometimes, for me at least, there was no right way of putting it. But, uh, Nonetheless, quite interesting data and a lot of pretty cool insights in there. All right, next thing we got here is HTM, uh, JS6 without transpiler. 700 bytes to run in a browser or compile it using Babel plugin HTM. Works with any VDOM library, which means that you can just include HTM, use it as a tag literal, right? And then just write React without any compilation steps. Now, um, for all of you people who are making new libraries that do something that already exists, right? Here's a masterclass from Mr. Develop It on how to properly sell it. So on the first tweet, he presents it, right? So this is what it does. And then there's a series of tweets that answers the most important questions that you can answer about the new library. Why might I want to use it? But is it slow? Does this have to be used in the runtime? Are there any other advantages? Essentially in those four short tweets, he explains why would you want to use it? When do you want to use it? How fast it is? And why do you like, you know, it's, it's just every library should include a questions like this. And I think he also includes it into the uh, GitHub repo, at least to some extent, um, which explains, you know, why the hell do you actually want to do that? So Nonetheless, it's really cool that essentially now, instead of setting up the whole React pipeline, you can just uh, include HTML here and uh, it will just work, which, which is kind of awesome. So do check it out. Okay, next thing we got here is BG Sound, a web component to emulate old school background sound elements. Um, yeah, if you, if you were, if you, um, if you, if you weren't online in 90s, uh, there was this BG Sound element that is now obsolete. And I think, I don't even know if it works in the browsers yet, but essentially it allowed you to play background sounds in loops. And it was terrible because once people discovered it, there was like billions of pages 
that you open and it immediately starts playing background sound and you're just, you know, becoming deaf because of it. So it became absolute for a reason. But um, apparently Mr. Ferris decided that we it have to be brought back. So it's now a web component <laughs> that you can use. Um, I mean, a silly experiment, but you know, it's pretty cool. And it, it also, like the cool thing is it also supports the MIDI sources. So it actually synthesizes the MIDI for you, which is uh, kind of neat. Um, yeah, do check it out. I think it's a pretty interesting project. And the work from develop it, uh, always impressed. Yeah, like he's really good at his stuff. Like just the preact alone worth a lot, but he's been doing so much work for Google since they hired him. There's like so many cool projects coming from him. Uh, you had to look for the window. Oh yeah, Bef before they've added this um, notification in Chrome where the sound is coming from. Yeah, it was even worse when you had like 20 tabs open. He's like, where's the music coming from? That's true. I completely forgot about that. <laughs> that is true, yeah. Okay, continuing, we got regular elements. It's basically like custom elements, but uh, works in older browsers and without like Shadow DOM or polyfills or classes or anything. It allows you to define your own elements and just use them in uh, older browsers or any browsers, I guess. And uh, the cool thing is even works in Internet Explorer 9. You only need the promise polyfill and that's it. So if you wanted to have some custom components, custom elements, uh, then do check it out. It seems quite nice. I don't know. I still think I would prefer React over that. I mean, I guess there might be some use cases when you just want like one component and that's it, one element, I guess, and that's it. But uh, yeah. Okay, continuing, we got autocomplete JS, simple autocomplete, pure vanilla JavaScript library. Um, essentially, yeah, just what it says. It's an autocomplete library and, uh, you know, it looks very slick. My problems with it is that there doesn't seem to be any simple way of customizing the view, as in, you know, you can include it and it seems to be quite flexible uh, code-wise, as in you can customize where the data comes from and so on and so forth, but there's no way to customize how it looks, which might be a small problem for, you know, when integrating it into your somehow designed app, right? So um, yeah, but nonetheless, pretty cool. Thing. Also, the amount of tags on this repository is terrifying. <laughs> okay, continuing, we got React scroll bars custom, best React custom scroll bars components. Exactly what it does. So this is the custom scroll bars that, uh, you know, uh, can appear or disappear like the Mac style, basically. It can also be um, sw swapped, uh, disabled, show tracks if needed, and so on and so forth. So I have a bunch of options. I uh, can also control the position and yeah, it's it seems to be pretty full featured actually. If you wanted to work with the scroll bars in React and you needed to wrap something, you know, in a pretty lengthy scroll bar, do check it out. This seems to be pretty good. Um, also seems like 60 FPS and everything. So seems to be pretty performant. Okay, next thing we got here is rex.js, your regular expression companion. Uh, yet another one of the... Ver verbose regex builders as in you know you can actually create the matcher and then use the functions to build a regular expression that would match something here's a basic expression that matches regex which is you know not exactly impressive but um there was yeah there was an introduction here on the dev tool and the um example here shows how to write the uh, regex for the ip addresses which is arguably not that easy to read as well. Like I know I get that the regular expression for the um, IP address is not easy to read, right? It's It might take some time to digest all of that, but arguably this is not much easier. <laughs> like, I don't know. Um, nonetheless, you know, if you're looking for the verbal regular expression constructor, do check it out. It seems to be nice and it's like version 1.0 now. So pretty small, pretty, efficient has good cut coverage and tests and everything so yeah maybe maybe you maybe you want something like this all right next thing we got here is construct ui a mithril ui library so if you never heard about mithril this is essentially a vdom framework like react but just you know slightly different essentially there's a bunch of them but uh, yeah mithril is one of those and i don't think i've heard about any ui libraries for it before so this one actually looks really slick. So if you are using Mithril and you wanted to have a nice UI library, then do check this out because this looks pretty good actually. So maybe this is what you were looking for. 
Okay, next thing we got here is Redux Orchestrate, a lightweight framework advocating fat reducer with the thin actions in Redux. I honestly have no idea what that means. I've looked at the example codes and they uh, create some sort of enhancer which is installed, done by install registry. It seems that is really, really complex. And I honestly did not have time to figure out what exactly it does and why you should use it over normal Redux. But maybe you are using Redux heavily and um, check it out. Maybe it will simplify some things for you. So, I, you know, as you might know, I haven't used Redux for the past few years because I switched to simpler things like unstated and, you know, things like this, because I honestly never worked on a project large enough to justify Redux. But maybe you do, and maybe this thing will save you some time. It's also like just 1.2 kilobytes. So um, just check it out. Maybe, maybe it's a good thing for you. So I just can't really comment on that. Sorry. Okay. Next thing we got here is Nevo. This one is really awesome. It is a rich set of data viz components built on top of D3JS and React. And it's absolutely awesome. So um, it allows you to build the diagrams like this. And it also comes with... Um, bunch of really cool features pre-baked like the react motion animations. So when you change the data, it will actually animate all of that and it looks super slick. Like this is just awesome. It also has a bunch of, um, you know, typical diagrams that you would have like, you know, the sunburst. For whatever reason, there's no animation here. Like, yeah, the bullets, this looks slick. <laughs> just look at those animations. I could sit here and click this for ages. This is just so good. Um, sometimes the package descriptions get you lost. Yeah, I mean, good package descriptions worth a lot. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so there's like, you know, just about any diagram that you can imagine, including the traditional like lines and pies and radars and whatever. And it looks really good. So if you're working with diagrams in React, do check it out because this seems to be a very solid set of components and I forgot to start it. Let me fix that right now. Um, yeah. That's, uh, they even published as a separate sub packages so you can only install whatever you want and not drag the whole thing in, which is also quite cool. Right, next thing we got here is CMSJS, a client-side JavaScript side generator. What that means is essentially it takes um, the uh, markdown or whatever. Um, yeah, I think it uses markdown in the backend. So it takes markdown from your GitHub repo and just renders it on the client. This is what it means by the client-side generation. The problem with it is that they had a demo somewhere. Um, there we go, demo. The problem with it is that if your if your JavaScript is blocked, right, you will see this, which is like, now Gatsby renders everything on the server, right? So that means that um, even if your JavaScript is disabled, Gatsby will still show you something. In this case, if your JavaScript is disabled or the ad block blocks something, you will see a white page, which is unfortunate. I guess it could be patched to say, hey, you enable your JavaScript or close the ad block or whatever. It's it's to be expected. I mean, it's basically offloading the rendering uh, from the server to the client side. So you can actually host the whole thing on the uh, GitHub pages, right? So, but again, you know, for GitHub pages, there's like Jack Hill. So I don't know if that's justified, but maybe you were looking for something like this. Maybe you know what to do with that. So check it out. Um, seems, seems okay. Okay. Next thing we got here is Vasmer. Build once, run anywhere. Universal binaries powered by WebAssembly. Really cool idea. I've This is something I've been thinking about um, since I've read this article from the Cloudflare on how they use the V8 isolates to run, you know, WebAssembly functions as the um, essentially cloud functions. Yes, it is written in Rust. Um, and the idea is basically very simple, right? So you can actually use the VASMR to run and I imagine in the long runs, compile your VASM files into a binary, which, um, so I, I, I don't know. So just let, let me just humor me for a second, right? So we got this PKG module, right? That takes your JavaScript app and packages it into one binary that is already quite efficient. So if you take a relatively complex app like Exaframe, uh, you get the release and it is packaged into Node and is like, you know, 40, 30 megabytes, depending on the platform. And that includes the Node.js and the app itself. So it's actually quite small. Now, um, my guess is that at some point, someone will build a tool that will be able to build your JavaScript app into WebAssembly 
then put it together with V8 and only put with, you know, the required uh, slice of APIs to produce even smaller binary that would run anywhere. And I think this is sort of the um, long, long, uh, long term goal of all of those tools, but I'm kind of curious to see if there will be one of those coming from a major player like Facebook or Google or, you know, Microsoft maybe. Um, I mean, we already have compiled JS, let's face it. Uh, Babel is compiled JS, React JSX is compiled JS. So we got compiled JS for a long time now, but um, this is sort of the, uh, I feel like this is gonna be the thing in a few years at most. And it sounds amazing to be honest. So if I could just take my JavaScript command line app and compile it into a binary that is like, you know, a couple of megabytes, that would be freaking amazing. And it also provides the speed of M assembly. So, okay, continuing. Uh, we got curl mail. This is actually not JavaScript service. This is just a really neat service that you can use to um, send yourself an emails using curl. Uh, you can literally just curl the address and provide the subject content or whatever. And, you know, again, it, since it works from the command line, you can actually pipe stuff into it or you can execute it after your dist upgrade is done and stuff like this. Obviously this is going through the someone server, so don't send anything sensitive there. But um, the thing that does notifications, I think that would work pretty well. So uh, maybe you were looking for something like this, do check it out. All right, uh, next thing we got here uh, is the Terrarium, another um, WebAssembly edge thing. So this is the multi-language deployment platform based on WebAssembly. The idea is that you can build something in a bunch of languages. So we created the TypeScript thing, but uh, you know, if you refresh the page, there was like Rust and uh, Vat and whatever, there's like a bunch of languages. And they, they provide this package that uh, allows you to create essentially a function as a service things. So you can actually write your own TypeScript and then you can click build and deploy and this will be deployed to the edge. So I, I imagine it works similar to this Cloudflare uh, edge workers, right? That use the V8 isolates to run the code. And you would actually get the working proper server from the machine code, right? So from your uh, thing, once again, this brings me to the whole idea that at some point we're gonna see all languages compiled to WebAssembly and then just working everywhere, which is, um, something that Java wanted to deliver, but uh, never quite nailed it. And I wonder if WebAssembly would do that. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, we're kind of moving that way. So it's it's interesting. Uh, there's a bunch of docs here. So they, for now they support C, TypeScript and Rust. Um, maybe that sounds interesting to you. Do check it out, maybe play a bit with it. Um, like it's, I don't think it's open source to be honest. I, at least I couldn't find any GitHub repos references here, but uh, it's really cool to see experiments like this. Okay, um, last demo we have here is called Doodle Master. And uh, the tagline is don't code your UI, draw it. And it's basically an, using TensorFlow to try to predict um, the things that you draw into the proper UI elements, right? So there's the GIF on the screen, the guy draws the um, header and it becomes a header. He draws the another element and becomes like the text view. And then he just compiles it into the actual code that is rendered, which is uh, kind of cool. I mean, I get, you know, it looks, it looks like a experimental projects and there's a lot of things that you can improve here, but it's a really cool demo. So it uses the PyTorch uh, with a deep learning model that basically does predictions. And then there's some UI that uh, basically translates that into the uh, final thing. So it requires Python 3 to run. And then the, I, I don't know, the server seems to be React, I think is a good question. I don't see it here, but uh, nonetheless, it's pretty cool. So uh, if you are interested in sort of building UIs from um, images, I guess, it's a nice experiment, do check it out. Okay, that's it for the demos. Now we got some silly stuff. This is my favorite tweet of the week. Um, it's a rabbit holding a package saying npm install and then it's a rabbit holding 2 billion packages saying oh no, which is a perfect depiction of npm install. 
Um, I'm still curious of um, to see when the deno will be finished and how the whole thing there will go because they don't have npm there, right? Okay, um, and the last thing I got to show is this uh, Twitter thread that actually it should be read from the last tweet it has, uh, it's like a bunch of retweets. So it all started with uh, someone tweeting, um, you want to stay relevant as a software developer for the next 10 years? There are three major things you should focus on, GraphQL, WebAssembly, and Web Components. And then someone retweeted this saying, you want to stay relevant for software developer in the next 10 years, these are three major things you need to focus in, SOAP and VS specification, Enterprise Service Bus, and Ajax with XML, circa 2008. <laughs> Which is already hilarious, but then someone went even further. So you want to stay relevant for the next 10 years, learn ActiveX, OLE in ATL, 1998. <laughs> and then there was someone even older there who was like, hey, there are three major things you should focus on, Clipper, Quick Basic, and Hypercard, 1988. <laughs> Which is, when you think about it, you know, so it's like if you try to predict technologies that are going to be the next big thing for 10 years, you're probably going to fail because all of those mentioned technologies at a time looked like incredible breakthroughs, right? But all of them somehow ended up being forgotten pretty fast. I mean, I'm sure there's still companies that work with them and everything, but more than a legacy, you know, as a legacy software rather than anything. So it's quite curious to see this sort of perspective that uh, even, even if we talk about, um, you know, 2008, that was like 10 years ago, right? This Ajax with XML, Enterprise Service Bus, and SOAP and VS Specs. Is that, like, I mean, yeah, I guess in some form we still have those, but it's insane what 10 years can do. <laughs> All right, guys, that is it from my side. It's not too much this time around, but uh, there you go. There was episode 38. If you got any questions, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. If not, we can just wrap this up and go have an uh, awesome rest of the weekend or the week. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links in the uh, channel description or video description or the whatever you're watching this, it should be somewhere there. Um, as usual, feel free to send your news over my way through Twitter, Discord, whatever the hell way you want, GitHub. We'll be more than happy to cover them if it's your personal projects even more so. Um, join our Discord server. We're always happy to see more people there. We're always happy to help you if you have some problems with software development, JavaScript, or any other things. I am uh, quite a long time there. So yeah, just uh, join up and let's talk. Yeah, thank you for watching, guys. Right, seems like no more questions. So uh, again, huge thanks for watching. Huge thanks for supporting me. Um, yeah, have an awesome rest of the weekend. Go do something unproductive and I see you next time. Bye.